Good morning. We welcome you once again to our Golden Lamp Stand online service. It's good to have you with us once again today. Today we want to offer our hearts to God in thanksgiving for some of the things that have happened in our country. We have just been through an election and the 10th Prime Minister of Malaysia has been officially appointed and installed and he has taken office. So we thank God for all that God is doing in our nation. We also want to thank all the people who have been praying for Malaysia, Malaysians, uh, foreigners within our land, and also people all over the world who have raised their voices in prayer for our nation. We thank all of you. But above all, we want to thank God for His gracious hand of love and mercy that is upon our nation. So we thank God. And with that, let me start this service by reading to you Psalm 95 verses 1 to 3. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before Him with thanksgiving and extol Him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you because you are a God of goodness. We thank you because your steadfast love is always upon us, upon our families, upon our country. We thank you that you bless us with one blessing after the other. We are so thankful for the G15, the last election that was held in Malaysia. We acknowledge that your hand is upon our nation and you are sovereign over all. So we offer our hearts to you in thanksgiving for your goodness. Father, we also want to come before you and ask that you bless our service. Let your hand be upon us. Speak and minister into our hearts and we pray that our worship would be a sweet smelling offering that goes before your throne. In the Lord Jesus name we pray. Amen.
prescribed reading for today is Acts chapter 27, 28 and Romans chapter 1. And today we like to look at Acts chapter 28 verses 1 to 10. Attitudes matter, the Malta stop over. So we like to look at some of the events that happened to Paul as they had to stop over in this island called Malta. This message today is a message that was recorded at Tabernacle of Day Spring three years ago. Nevertheless, I believe with all my heart, the Lord wants to minister to us through this message. I have included all the readings and also the points so that it will be easier to follow this message. But this message is only an audio message. Uh, nevertheless, I believe that the Word of God will minister to you, the Lord Bless you. Today I want to share with you concerning attitudes matter, the Malta stopover. Uh, what I want to share with you today is about an incident. Paul is taken as a prisoner in Jerusalem because the Jews are angry with him because he speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ and he also speaks about the Jews killing the Lord Jesus Christ. So what they do is they plot to kill him. So he is shipped to Caesarea. And then in Caesarea, he's brought before King Agrippa, he's brought before Governor Felix, the Governor Festus, and Paul appeals to go uh, before Caesar. He says, I'm innocent, I want to stand before Caesar. And he is uh, from Caesarea, they send him to Rome, and, and Rome is quite far away. You, you see the map, you see Rome is quite far away. But along the journey, as they move from place to place, they come to the island of Crete. The weather is really bad, and they sail to another place. I can't remember where, which is nearby. But because of the strong winds, they are taken off course, and they go into deep sea. They go into a great sea. And the weather is really bad, and uh, they don't see daylight for a few days. They are in this terrible storm, and that ends in a shipwreck. And as they come out of the shipwreck, they come to this island called Malta. And I want to tell you about what happened in Malta today. Because I call it the Malta stopover. Malta was not part of the destination. They were not supposed to be in Malta. They had gone through a storm and now they are stranded in this island called Malta. And in that situation, going through the storm and being destroyed, they come out of the, the sea with nothing but their clothes. Everything is lost. But when they come into the island, things change. And the reason things change is because of the attitude of Paul and his companions. Of course, because Paul is there and he leads people into the right attitude. So, I want to share with you about attitudes matter. Because all of us go through that storm. And as we go through the storm, I want to share with you about how our attitudes can turn every storm into a blessing. And that's what we want to speak about this morning. Because the church just went through one kind of stormy season. We just came out of the MCO. The weather is stormy and we need to change our attitudes so that every storm Every shipwreck can become a blessing in our lives. Let's go to the text. Let's go to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28 is the last chapter in the book of Acts. And after that, we see Paul in Rome. And, and he continues his ministry until he's executed. This is on the way to his last stop. And that's the end of the book of Acts. So let's read Acts chapter 28, verses 1 to 10. Let me read it for you. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and as he put it on the fire, a wiper driven out by the heat fastened itself to his hand. When the islanders saw a snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer 
for though he escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead, but after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home for three days and entertained us hospitably. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. Verse 9, when this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. As we look into this word this morning, we want to pray and invite the Spirit of God to come upon us. We want to pray and invite the Spirit of God to speak to each one of us. Father, we want to pray for a ministry of the Holy Spirit upon your people this morning. As the world goes through different storms, as, as each one of us will have to face our own storm, and, and sometimes we, we are discouraged because we think we are shipwrecked, but in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we declare and decree this morning that every shipwreck will be turned into a blessing. And Father, as we look at your word this morning, we pray that you speak to us and you change our attitudes because our attitudes make our struggles into blessings. So we thank you and we praise you as we meditate upon the word Holy Spirit speaking into our hearts today. In the Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, uh, this text, uh, we want to look at, at two portions. It's a very short text, 10 verses. I'm going to speak to you about the first part as you go into the island and then it, it elevates to a different situation. That's uh, when Publius, the uh, chief official of that place, takes Paul to his own home. So we're going to look at two parts in this text. But basically, what we need to understand here is that Paul is now being taken as a prisoner to Rome and this place that they are in is a surprise stopover. Point one, it is a surprise stopover. Uh, let me read Acts chapter 28, verse 1. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. You see, they, they didn't even know the name of the island. They, they had no idea where they were. And you see the map, Malta was basically quite far off, you know. They were like 14 days in the sea. They were being blown by the wind. The captain had no idea where they were. The centurion Julius had no idea where they were. And they didn't even know whether they would survive this storm. But when they survived the storm, it was a surprise stopover. And sometimes in our lives we have surprise stopovers. Meaning, sometimes we think we are going this way, we think we are heading in this direction, but something happens and we are moved to a different direction. We are moved to a different place. We are moved to a place where sometimes we don't even know where we are. We don't know what God is doing in our life. We don't know what's going to happen next because we think that we are shipwrecked. We are off course. Don't moan about it. Move with the flow because God has a purpose. Because God has a purpose and God has a plan for everything that happens to us in our lives. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. We are all called according to the purpose of God, and because God loves us, no matter where we are, God can still change the situation into something good. We need to recognize that every stop is a divine stop. If God has allowed it to happen to you, then God can bring some good out of it happening in your life. So the attitude that we need to have is an attitude that is focused on God, knowing that in every situation, God can bring about that good. We need to understand 
that God is in control. We need to understand that God sits on the throne. And there's nothing that God cannot do. There's no situation that God cannot turn around. And the very fact that He's allowed us to go through it means there is an opportunity for Him to teach us and bring about a lot of good in our life. How do we know this? The way we know this is as we read this text, we see the ending so much different from the beginning. When they go into Malta, it is like a mess, a total mess. They don't know who the people are, they don't know where they are, they don't know whether they will be killed or, or they are cannibals, or they have no idea where they are. But when they come out of Malta, they come out with the blessing of the people. And they know that they have left something behind that is a blessing to the people. So God can change every situation into a blessing when our attitudes are right. And that's the first thing I want to share. The second thing I want to share with you is Paul's continual service. Verse 3, Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and as he put it on the fire, a wiper driven out by heat fastened itself into his hands. Now, as they are there, the word of God says that as they came to the island, the people were very friendly, they were surprised. These people were really friendly. It was raining, and it was dark, and it was cold, and as they came, the people put a fire and welcomed them. So they, they thought, oh, that, that was really warm. But here, in the midst of the fire, there, Paul is gathering brushwood, and he takes the brushwood, and as he puts it into the fire, a viper, a snake, a poisonous snake, you'll speak about viper a bit later, comes and catches hold of his hand. Now, the first question I need to ask is, why was Paul gathering brushwood? There were 276 people on the ship that got shipwrecked. And Paul says that none of these lives will be lost, and so there are 276 people who have gone to the island, and there's Julius, who's a century and the commander of the whole group, and there are soldiers. And on top of soldiers, there are prisoners. Paul is one of them. And on top of the prisoners, there are passengers. Could be no Luke was there, and some other people were there. And there were natives there in that place. So my question is why was Paul putting brushwood into the fire? Because even in the journey on the boat, Paul was a man of God, and everybody knew he was a man of God. People won't want him to serve. Even when the prisoners were escaping the boat, they wanted to kill the prisoners because if the Romans don't bring the prisoners back, then it's life for life. So they wanted to kill the, the prisoners. But Julius, the centurion, said, let's spare their lives because they wanted to spare Paul's life. So he was honored about the men. And even when they were going through the storm, Paul instructed them on what needed to be done. He broke bread and prayed to them. So why was Paul doing this work? Simple. Because he had an attitude of servanthood. That wherever he went, he served. So the second thing that we need to know is we need to have an attitude of servanthood. And it goes on to say, as he was putting that brush into the fire, a snake, a viper, got onto his hand, hung onto his hand, fastened itself into his hand. And it's amazing. Because the word of God says that Paul shook his hands and the snake fell off. When we are serving God, things will come. When we are in that position where we constantly serve God, we have an attitude of serving God. Now, serving God is actually having a heart of a servant. That's basically it. And if anything needs to be done, then the servant needs to get it done. That's the attitude of serving food. This is another surprise. The first surprise was they go to the stone and they should make it to this island. And the second surprise is he never expected the snake to be there. Maybe it's a lesson for us. Wherever you don't expect a snake, that's where the snake will be. And the snake is a symbol 
of temptation, it's a symbol of weakness, it's a symbol of trials, it's a symbol of everything that is there to disrupt our walk with God. And it's amazing. He just shook his hands and the snake was in the fire. My brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, just as amazing as you see Paul do, it's so simple, he just shake his hands. I believe that in our lives, every attack is also like that. It's just that we need to learn to know how to shake our hands into the fire. The third thing I want to share with you is the failed expectation. When, when I speak about the failed expectation, it starts off by saying that the people expected him to swell up or something like They had expectations. Now I want to make a statement. God does not need to submit to human expectations based on human experience. Let me say that again. God does not need to submit to human expectations based on human experience. So, whatever we have experienced, whatever we think God needs to do, God doesn't need to do anything. God is beyond. The question we ask is, why didn't he die? And I was drawn back to this text, Mark 16, 17 and 18. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they get the empty point, they will not hurt them at all, they will place their hands on the sick, and they will get well. Let me read verse 18 again. They will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. This is the word of God. The third thing that we need to do. Our attitude must be an attitude that takes God at His word. If God said it, then it must be true. The Lord Jesus Christ said, John 14, 7, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. And if we learn to take God at His word, His word works. His word works. But I want to also say this. We cannot overnight take God at His word. You need to grow into taking God's word. That means if you don't take God's word in simple things, you cannot take God's word in big things. You need to grow into it. But the third attitude that we must have is an attitude of taking God at His word. Because His word works. And unfortunately for a man like me, I grew up in the church and I always wanted to be a pastor and I've been a pastor for about 25 years, a full-time pastor. And it's taken me so long to understand some basic things like this. That God's word really works. And now I'm learning to take God's word and put it in practice and get us that God's word works. We need to have that attitude of taking God for His word. Number four, the people responded by seeing His God. 28.6, it starts off with, the people expected Him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. And He didn't fall dead. So, as we, we spoke about earlier, the expectations were let down. And then they switched, you know. They said He's a God. And this confused me a little. Just one miracle, and I, I don't even know if this is actually a miracle. He just, he just threw the snake into a fire. I mean, of course, in the mind of the natives of Malta, this is a viper. It's a very deadly snake. This is a snake that kills, and once it fastens itself on your arm, you cannot let go. You are dead. But in this case, Paul just shook it away, and now they say that it's a God. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, He walked on earth, He was full with miracles. Everywhere He went. In fact, John says that if everything about what Christ did were to be written, all the books in the world would not be enough. And I believe the Lord Jesus Christ was performing miracles every day. Big miracles, small miracles. He, he was touching people, small, small things that, that happened every day. He was so full of miracles, but the question that we need to ask is, why was it so difficult for the Jews to accept Him as God? 
where it was so easy for the people of Malta to see one miracle and call Paul a God. In fact, we see that quite often in the Bible. When Paul goes and does things, they even said that the gods have come to be among us, about Paul and Barnabas. But why was it so hard? And I want to refer to this verse that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke in Matthew 13, 15. He says, For this people's heart has become callous, they hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes, otherwise they may see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and I will heal them. So the hindrance to faith is this. And the Lord mentioned three things. He mentioned the heart, He mentioned the ears, and He mentioned the eyes. This was spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ right after He spoke about the parable of the sower. And the disciples came to Him and asked Him for the explanation of the parable of the sower. And then the Lord Jesus Christ said that the parables are given so that some people can hear the parables but they are unable to listen to what the parable says. Here it says that because their heart is callous and they, are hardly, uh, they hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. And this verse is repeated again at the end of this chapter in Acts. Because when Paul, who has this amazing ministry in Malta, goes back to Rome and when he meets the Jews, finds that the problem is still there. So Acts chapter 28 repeats this verse later to the end. And this time it's not spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ, it's spoken by Luke. The hardness of the heart. Kalaos, the Greek word, pachuno, meaning to thicken, to fatten. Pachuno basically means the heart is fattened. The heart cannot get through. Now the, the English word basically means uh, emotionally hardened, having a skin that is tough and thick. The heart cannot be penetrated. And then uh, let me put up another word. Barrepos. Barrepos. Basically means the ears are barrepos, dull. The ears are heavy. You cannot hear. Or maybe they don't want to hear. Or maybe they don't want to hear because it does not suit them. Maybe they don't want to hear because it doesn't go along with what they want. So sometimes the problem with us is our hearts become too thick, our hearts become too heavy, and our ears become too dumb. We don't want to hear. Quite a number of years ago, a lady came up to me one day. I said, Pastor, why do you run your church like this? Why do you do this? Why don't you allow these things? So I said, okay. I will explain to you why I don't allow these things. I opened the Bible and I showed her. The Bible said don't allow these things in the church. Very clear, you know. And then she got angry with me. And then she said, she said something like, I know what it says, but you're still wrong. And then she just walked out. Because what is in the Word of God doesn't suit her. It doesn't suit us. So what we do is we harden our hearts and then we dull, make our ears dull. We don't want to hear. It's, it's not a problem with God's word, it's a problem with our attitude. So our attitudes need to change. We need to all be open to what God is saying. Sometimes our personal theology clashes with theology. Whenever something doesn't go along with what we are doing, the attitude changes and we reject it. We become hard-hearted. We don't want to hear. It doesn't suit our tradition. It doesn't suit our family. It doesn't suit our superiority. The fourth thing I want to share with you is that we must let our hearts hear what God is saying. But having said that, sometimes in our situation, even when we share, people don't want to hear us. Now the Lord Jesus Christ said something about that also. Yeah, Matthew 10, 12. If you enter a home, give it your greeting. If the home is serving, let your peace rest on it. If not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust of your feet when you leave that home. In our course of ministry, we will meet people with hardened hearts and values. Don't choke the word down. I know when I was... Um, very young, I remember very clearly. I had this good friend and I liked him very much. And I choked down the gospel into his throat, you know. And now, many years later, I think, pity the poor guy. 
I insisted, you must accept Christ. The people are not there, just give them. Our job is to share the gospel. Our job is to minister Christ. Our job is not to convert people. Sometimes we are a bit confused. The results are not our doing. We have to give it to the Lord. The second part is now, Publius, who is a chief official, takes Paul and maybe a few of them, possibly you, because we know Luke was in that group, to his home. And now the ministry progresses. Now the situation changes because of all the people, I told you 276 people are shipwrecked in that island. And then there is Julius, who is the centurion, the man who is in charge of all the soldiers. Of course, there are a lot of soldiers there, and then there are some passengers down there. But this man, Publius, who is the chief official of that place, I, I checked some of the commentaries. When it says chief official, it's saying that he is the most powerful man in that place. We are talking about somebody who has the ranking of a prime minister, or a king, or an emperor. He controls the whole island. But this guy singles out Paul and maybe a few people with Paul and takes them to his home. Now, the ministry is elevated. When God looks at us and sees how we do things, He moves us from one level to another. This is what God does. And God singled out Paul. Paul was a prisoner, you know. He still needed to be guarded by the soldiers, but Publius takes him out of that situation and puts him in his home. And he's there for three days, and the Word of God says that he welcomed us in his home and three days entertained us hospitably. And I think what has happened here is for three days, now Paul is in the... This is going to be... This is possibly the most comfortable home around. And, and he cannot be touched because Publius is now the most powerful person in that area, and now he's got all the convenience. Maybe they are servants to attend to him and all that. He welcomed us to his home and for three days entertained us hospitably. I think what's going on here is he is entertaining Paul and as he's entertaining Paul, Paul is treating him with the word of God. You know what's happening? There's ministry. Because when you are faithful, God will push you up to the level where you can minister. And there's ministry going on down here now. For three days, I believe Paul continually was persistent in sharing with him. Now, the attitude that we need to capture here is faithfulness. The problem with us is we want giant-sized ministries, then we want to be faithful. If you're not faithful where you are, you will never reach your giant-sized ministry. Because God wants His people to be faithful in small things. And three days, they have been there. And I think the three days also is speaking about the season. And the season appointed by God was that three days. The attitude that we must have is faithfulness. We need to always be faithful. No matter how small the situation is, no matter how much we don't see progress, we don't see anything going on. And, and for many of us to think, oh, Paul was sitting in the house and oh, enjoying the party, but no, he, I believe he was serving. Because if you read Paul's life, everywhere he went was a ministry. Be faithful. Be faithful where you are. Continually be faithful. Because when you are faithful, we come to the next point. A miracle happened. And there was an estate nearby belonging to Publius. I think you all can read, huh? Verse 8, it says, Father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. After prayer, Paul went and he placed his hands on him and cried on him. Now, when we are faithful, the time will come when there will be a miracle. And to get to our miracle, we need to be patient. The attitude is patience. We need to focus on what we are doing. It doesn't matter if there are no fruits. Because from our perspective, there will not be fruits. There are times when we do things and we don't see anything. And I come to my uh, last point. There was breakthrough. And at the end, there will be breakthrough. 
there will be breakthrough. There will be breakthrough in our lives. There will be breakthrough in our country. Because the King of Kings will come and reign. And coming and reigning is all about breakthrough. And the, the Word of God says that when this happened, when, when one man got healed, there was breakthrough. The Bible says that the rest of the sick, how many sick people? The rest of the sick in the island, the whole island came and were cured. The meaning of this word is the rest were cured. I want to encourage those of you who have been praying for the country. You know, you pray, pray, pray for the country. You pray for this and that, and you work and work and work. And you come to a point where you say, nothing is happening. The breakthrough will come. And when the breakthrough comes, we will not be able to understand the dimensions of the breakthroughs. I mean, what? So there was a healing ministry. But I want to speak to you about this. If you read the text, the whole text doesn't speak about preaching. It doesn't speak about teaching. It doesn't speak about the gospel. It doesn't speak about anything that Paul did. But I want to share with you finally, in conclusion, the attitude we must have is a lifestyle of Christ. Because it was the lifestyle of Paul. Read through the whole of the book of Acts. This guy cannot stop talking about Christ. His life cannot exist out of Christ. And that's why he says, in Christ, he says, this is possible. In Christ, we overcome. In Christ, we have victory. In Christ, we are not condemned. In Christ, everything about in Christ. Because this man was in Christ. He was so in Christ. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, he says, that the attitude that you should have is the attitude of Christ. And so, everything about our lives, it's about Christ. So the final attitude that we must have is the attitude of Christ. And the attitude of Christ is to have a lifestyle of Christ within us and we just share the life. Ministry becomes a lot easier. We don't need to do things for ministry. It is our lifestyle. And if it's within you and it becomes a part of you, it becomes your attitude. And everywhere you go, you leave a mark. Now, what we see here is once the light starts shining, everything is drawn towards the light. Once Christ is in you, and you have an attitude of Christ, your light slowly begins to shine. And if you rewind back to what I said in the beginning, when we hold on to all these attitudes, even if we go through a storm, even if we are shipwrecked, we can turn every situation into a blessing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for a man like Paul. We thank you for his example. And we thank you that Paul said, be imitators of me as I am an imitator of Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And we thank you for a person who had the attitude of Christ. And we thank you that throughout his journey, his lifestyle, everything he did, his servanthood, his perseverance, his faithfulness, his patience, Lord, we see that, that he could turn every storm, every shipwreck, every difficult situation into a blessing because you were with him. And we want to release that anointing upon your people today, that every one of us will leave this place with that attitude, that Christ is in me, and Christ in me is the hope of glory. And Father, we thank you for your word and this morning as we place your word in the hearts of your people. We pray that there will be breakthrough. In the Lord Jesus' name we pray.
you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessings of God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for joining us once again at our Golden Lamb Stand online service. We pray the Lord be with you, bless you with his presence in the coming week and that you will enjoy his grace.